Can you praise him this morning because he's victorious? Because he's won the victory, we get to go with him.
will, they exist. You weren't created. And if you're a Christian, that'll be you someday. I right, understand when we come together in church, it's just kind of practice for heaven, right? It's just, just a warm up, just a, a little, little taste, a little piece of that. In the next chapter, the focus goes from God the Father to Jesus Christ, the, the Lamb of God. It says, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Crying out, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne to the Lamb forever and ever. Let's just bow together. Give the Lamb of God praise. Worship Jesus. Thank Him for your salvation. If you're a Christian, it's all the blood of Jesus. It's all what we celebrate in communion. His body broken, His blood spilled, His grace, Him doing what we fail to do, Him doing what we can never do. It's Him substituting Himself in our place. The innocent for the sinful. The righteous for the unrighteous. Taking our sin upon Him. Giving us His righteousness in exchange. In return. That's the Gospel. That's Christianity. That's our hope. That's our life. That's our everything. And when we take communion, it's a time to remember that. It's a time to celebrate that. It's a time to thank Him. It's a time to worship Him time to search our hearts, confess our sins, and, you know, if there's unconfessed sin in our life, I mean, we're still justified, we're still in relationship with God, but it's time to go back to the cross and and remove those stains that come into our daily lives so that we can be in fellowship, communion with Him. I encourage you to do that. Lord Jesus, we give you praise and worship and honor you. Lord, we thank you for the church, we thank you for this church. We thank you for the opportunity to come together as your people, your family, your body, your bride, to be able to practice for heaven, to be able to worship you corporately. We thank you that the veil has been torn, that it is done, that it is finished, and that we can come into your presence by your name and through your blood at any time, that we can know you now spiritually, and we thank you that someday we'll see you face to face. Lord, remind us now of why and how that that's the case. Help us to see the fresh and anew. Help us not to take that for granted. Lord, thank you for loving the unlovely. Thank you for pursuing us as we have run away from you. Thank you for gracing us when we are undeserving. Thank you for saving us when we could never save ourselves. God, we ask you to cleanse us of our sins, to fill us with your spirit, or to draw us closer to you than we've ever been. Lord, Reveal yourself to us. Be glorified in this time. Lord, I just pray that we would see you high and lifted up. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. So, is it?
Purpose-driven life. High-selling, hard copy book of all time other than the Bible. One of the most vilified in religious circles for reasons that are completely uh, beyond my comprehension. Um, starts out by quoting Colossians 1.16 from the message. For everything, absolutely everything, above and below, visible and in- invisible, everything got started in Him, talking about Jesus, and finds its purpose in Him. And then Rick Warren writes this, It's not about you. First life lesson we need to learn, right? Hardest life lesson to learn, right? Because we're born thinking it's all about us. Every one-year-old, that you're, every two-year-old, right, that you're battling with right now, thinks the universe revolves around them. And we can still think that way when we're adults. It's not about you. The purpose of your life is far greater than your own personal fulfillment, your peace of mind, or even your happiness. It's far greater than your family, your career, or even your wildest dreams and ambitions. 
If you want to know why you were placed on this planet, you must begin with God. You were born by His purpose and for His purpose. The search for the purpose of life has puzzled people for thousands of years. That's because we typically begin at the wrong starting point ourselves. We ask self-centered questions like, what do I want to be? What should I do with my life? What are my goals, my ambitions, my dreams for my future? But focusing on ourselves will never reveal our life's purpose. The Bible says it is God who directs the lives of His creatures. Everyone's life is in His power. Contrary to what many popular books, movies, and seminars tell you, you won't discover your life's meaning by looking within yourself. You probably already tried that, right? It says, I once got lost in the mountains. When I stopped to ask for directions to the campsite, I was told this. You can't get there from here. You must start from the other side of the mountain. In the same way, you cannot arrive at your life's purpose by starting with a focus on yourself. You must begin with God, your Creator. You exist only because God wills that you exist. You were made by God and for God, and until you understand that, life will never make sense. It is only in God that we discover our origin, our identity, our meaning, our purpose, our significance, and our destiny. Every other path leads to a dead end. And so, if it's not about us, that leads to the second question. What is it all about then? I want you to understand, as we finish up this series we've been doing called Don't Waste Your Life, I really could have started with this message or I could have ended with this message. And I decided to end with this message, even though there's one more week in the series. We're going to have a guest preacher next week, one of the most well-known preachers in America, by video. We'll, we'll, we'll be here. That's how we're going to end the series. But... Uh, I believe, and, and, and this is one of, one of the things I want you to get out of this message, is what we're talking about today as we talk about the glory of God could be the most important topic in all the Bible because it undergirds every other topic. Everything else is about, is exists for the glory of God. And so, Rick Warren says this in chapter 7. He says, it's all for Him. The ultimate goal of the universe is to show the glory of God. It is the reason for everything that exists, including you. God made it all for His glory. Without God's glory, there would be nothing. Now, you say, hang on a second. It's all for Him. I thought God was about me. Right? It, it doesn't even the Bible say that God's for us? Right? It, it says that, doesn't it? I mean, it says that in Romans chapter 8. And you, know, you think about something, uh, you know, maybe the well, most well-known chapter in the Bible, the 23rd Psalm. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. Right? Sounds like that's about me. Uh, you know, he, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. Sounds like God's into me. You know, He's interested in me. He wants to bless me, right? He leads me beside still waters. He leads me in paths. He's leading me. He's doing it He's for me, though. Uh, you know, he talks about how he uh, cup overflows and, you know, he, he does all these things for us. But there's one little phrase in there. It says, for my name's sake. See, God may be for us, but that's secondary. God's ultimately for himself, and even what he does for us is for his glory. It's not about me. It's about him. And any time we make stuff about us, we mess everything up because we're going against the very design of the universe. We even do that in church. We make stuff about us. We want it to be a certain way, a certain style of music, a certain song, a certain program. And we miss the whole point of everything. He goes on and he's asked this question. It's an important question. What is the glory of God? What's the answer? It is who God is. It's a great definition. It's the essence of His nature. It's just who He is. The weight of His importance. 
You see, the, the word way, or glory in Hebrew, that's, it literally means heaviness, weightiness. And see, when we take God's name in vain, essentially what we're doing is we're taking God lightly instead of taking Him seriously. We're, we're esteeming Him little instead of you know, looking at Him as big and weighty and heavy and, and, and important, not in a physical sense, but a spiritual sense. It's the radiance of His splendor. You know, the glory of God is all of God's inward perfections shining forth from Him outwardly. And it's so strong that in heaven there's no sun. It's lit by the glory of God. So the glory of God is even brighter than the sun. It's the demonstration of His power, the atmosphere of His presence. God's glory is the expression of His goodness and all His other intrinsic, eternal qualities. You say, well, where is the glory of God? Man? Just look around. Everything created by God reflects His glory in some way. We live in an orderly creation because God's a God of glory. We live in a beautiful creation because God is a beautiful God. I mean, it's beautiful even though it's not perfect anymore because it's been marred by sin. And so think about what it was like when He originally created. Think about what heaven's going to be like and understand that creation pales in comparison to the greatness and the glory of our God. We see it everywhere from the smallest microscopic form of life to the vast Milky Way, from sunsets and stars to storms and seasons. Creation reveals our Creator's glory. The Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. Throughout history, God has revealed His glory to people in different settings. He revealed it first in the Garden of Eden, then to Moses, then the tabernacle and the temple, then through Jesus and now through the church. It was portrayed as a consuming fire, a cloud, thunder, smoke, and a brilliant light. In heaven, God's glory provides all the light that is needed. But ultimately, God's glory is best seen in Jesus Christ. He, the light of the world, illuminates God's nature. Because of Jesus, we are no longer in the dark about what God is really like. The Bible says the sun is the radiance of God's glory. It says the Word became human and lived among us. We saw His glory, a glory full of grace and truth. God's inherent glory is what He possesses because He is God. It is His nature. We cannot add anything to His glory, just as it would be impossible for us to make the sun shine brighter. But we are commanded to recognize His glory, honor His glory, declare His glory, praise His glory, reflect His glory, and live for His glory. Why? Because God deserves it. We owe Him every honor we can possibly give. Now think about this. And this is the last thing I'm going to read from this book. In the entire universe, only two of God's creations fail to bring glory to Him. Fallen angels, demons, and us, people. All sin at its root is failing to give God glory. It is loving anything else more than God. Refusing to bring glory to God is prideful rebellion, and it is a sin that caused Satan's fall and ours too. In different ways, we have all lived for our own glory, not God's. And that's why the Bible says all have sinned, in which, you know, we don't really argue with that. But then I don't know if we give enough weight to, or maybe don't have enough understanding of the last part of that verse when it says, and fall short of the glory of God. That's what he's talking about. In our sin and self-absorption and living for ourselves, we fail to give God the glory that He's due, instead wanting it to go to us. So, to try to sum this whole series up, here's what it all boils down to. There's one of two ways that we can live our lives. We can live according to God's design, and we can live for His glory. Because, here's what Scripture says, Isaiah chapter 43, verse 7 says, Everyone who is called by my name, who I, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him, yes, I have made him. We were created to glorify God. So, we can live according to that design, or even to take it a step farther, we're saved for his glory. Ephesians 1, 6 says, To the praise of the glory of his grace, by which He made us accepted in the Beloved. 
You understand, even our salvation is about the glory of God. We get some awesome byproducts from it, but ultimately, at the end of the day, God saved us for Him, not for me. He didn't save me to make much of me. He saved me to make much of Him. He didn't save me because of some goodness in me. He saved me because of the goodness of Jesus Christ. He didn't save me because of some choice that I made. He saved me because He chose me before the foundation of the world. Even the faith that I have in Him is a gift of His grace for His glory. He saved me not because I was chasing after Him, but because He was chasing after me. He saves us to bring glory. He saves us to... And and the reason it's about the cross, and the reason it's about grace, and the reason we celebrate communion is just to say, I didn't deserve it. I didn't do it. All glory be to you. A a Christian, according to Philippians chapter 3, verse 3, is someone who has no confidence in the flesh, rejoices in Jesus Christ, and worships God in the Spirit. That means we rejoice in Jesus because we know it's all about Him, by Him, for Him, through Him. It's not me. it's, It's grace. And so we praise Him. That's what separates Christianity and religion. Religion says, you know, I've done this. I've earned this. I'm good enough. I'm not as bad as this other person. i followed the rules. And so God ought to let me into heaven. Yay me. Let's give me a pat on the back. Christianity is, all I can do is plead for mercy and grace. Do the eternal work. Two completely different things. But ultimately, even that is about who gets the glory. We glory in Him, not in ourselves. So, we can live to bring glory to God. Or we can live to bring glory to ourselves. We can, we can live for other things. And when we do that, we're an idolater. Now, I want you to understand, this may seem a little blunt, a little too black and white, but we can either live for the glory of God, or we can be an idolater. Now, I suppose probably all of us are some, you know, not all of us, if you're rejecting Jesus, you're an idolater. If you're Christian, there's probably some mix there. But uh, you say, well, okay, now hang on a second. We've kind of evolved past that. You know, we don't believe in all these primitive gods that believe in back in the Old Testament, that kind of thing. You know, we don't, I don't have a statue in my house. I'm not bowing down to a Buddha or something like that. But what I want you to understand is we still have our idols today. Anything that takes God's place in our life is an idol. It can be self, it can be another person, it can be a thing. Anything that has their ultimate allegiance. The thing that we're most passionate about, that we find comfort and security and peace in, the thing that gives us the most joy, the thing that we give glory to, the thing that we're most dedicated to, the thing that we give to, the things that we sacrifice for, that's our God. And listen, we're good at worshiping idols today. We've got our own modern-day idols. If you don't believe me, just kind of watch this video and and see what you think uh, uh, about this. I was watching TV the other day, and this show comes on with these religious fanatics. They were crazy. Well, you would think they were crazy if you didn't understand their culture and their religion. See, that's just the thing. They were worshippers of idols. And they took things to extremes. They painted their bodies. They wore these ridiculous costumes. They chanted. They danced. They, they made sacrifices to their idols. But they built these enormous temples to worship their idols. It seemed like their entire existence climaxed into this one scenario, this one over-the-top act of worship. You don't really relate, do you? Let's try it again. I was watching TV the other day, and this show comes on with these religious fanatics. They were crazy. See, that's just the thing. They were worshippers of idols, and they took things to extremes. They painted their bodies. They wore these ridiculous costumes. They chanted. They danced. They, they made sacrifices to their idols. The Bible built these enormous temples to worship their idols. It seemed like their entire existence climaxed into this one scenario, this one over-the-top act of worship. Idol worship. It's not just about golden calves anymore. So, 
here's the main idea. We're going to be in Jeremiah chapter 2, and I kind of want to flesh this out for you from there. When I, in, in this message, when I use the term sorry substitute, what I mean is an idol. Now you'll see why from this passage we call it, yeah, I'm calling it sorry substitute. But when, here, here's the main idea of this message. And to me, this kind of the main idea, if I wanted to encapsulate this whole series in one sentence, it's this. When we live for anything other than the glory of God, we end up living our lives for sorry substitutes. When we live for anything other than the glory of God, we end up living our lives for sorry substitutes. Let me show you why that's true. Jeremiah chapter 2, starting in verse 1. The prophet says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, and in understanding this historical context, this is a sermon, a prophetic word against Judah's uh, willful idolatry and really in spiritual infidelity uh, against the Lord. But I think it certainly applies to us today. And so, if we're Christian, because you're a Christian, I want you to, as we read this, and as I try to explain this, uh, we, I want us to think about, you know, is this us? Are we substituting things in place of Jesus in our lives? If you're not a Christian, let's see how this applies to you that everybody is a worshiper. Everybody has some kind of God, even atheists. And what, what are those gods going to do for you? Is Jesus really the one true God? And so if, if God says through the prophet here, Go and cry in the hearing of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, I remember you. The kindness of your youth, the love of your betrothal, when you went after me in the wilderness, in a land not sown. Israel was holiness to the Lord, the first fruits of his increase. All that devour him will offend, disaster will come upon them, says the Lord. So this is referring to how you know, God called Israel by his grace, not because they were worthy to be his, his own people. And, and he blessed them, and he took care of them. Verse 4. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. And thus says the Lord. And, and we need to let verse 5 just really sink into our soul. It says, What injustice have your fathers found in me? That they have gone far from me, have followed idols, and have become idolaters. You hear the question? You hear what God's asking His people here? He says, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me that you want substitutes for me? What's wrong with me that you would rather prostitute yourself with these false gods? That's what He says. I chose you. I, I, I blessed you. I brought you out of Egypt. I led you into the land of promise. I, I, I made you my people. I, I've you know, given you everything. And now you prefer wood and stone to me. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of when I sat with women whose husbands have cheated on them. And they tearfully, with a broken heart, asked the question, what's wrong with me? What I do? And of course, the answer is, it's his problem. And do you understand here with what God's saying? The answer is, it's our problem. The problem's not in him. You see, that's, that's what we're doing. When, when we aren't satisfied in the Lord, when we aren't worshiping the Lord, when we aren't living for his glory, when we're not, when our lives aren't about him. God's question to us is, what's wrong with me? He's not just a concept. He's not just a philosophy. He's not just an idea. He's not just something that's disposable on Sunday morning. He's real. And, and look at what he goes on to, to say here. Verse 6, Neither did they say, Where is the Lord who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, who led us through the wilderness? Through a land of deserts and pits, through a land of drought and the shadow of death. He's recounting some of these things that he's done for them. Through a land that no one crossed and where no one dwelt. I brought you into a bountiful country. 
to eat its fruit and its goodness. But when you entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. The priest did not say, where is the Lord? And those who handled the law did not know me. The rulers also transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal, and then notice this phrase, and walk after things that do not profit. The first thing I want you to see here is that sorry substitutes ignore the goodness of God. I mean, think about what he is saying he did for them. And now he's saying, you're going after these empty, lifeless, dead idols that profit nothing, that can't do anything for you. I've done all these things for you. What's wrong with me? Think of what he said, would say to us today. He and I've given you life. I've given you health. You're here because I put you here. You're not an accident. I, I, I put you in a place of uh, freedom. I put you in a place that compared to the rest of the world is a prosperous place. I mean, you know, I've given you a wife or a husband. I've given you kids. I've taken care. You've got a house. You've got cars. You've got all these things. But even beyond that, I gave my son for you. What's wrong with me? Why do you go after all these things that don't profit, that are worthless? You know why Thanksgiving is so important? And I'm not talking about, you know, a 30 days of Thanksgiving thing on Facebook. Oh, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not thinking about, they're talking about, you know, just praying a prayer on Thanksgiving Day and, you know, one day out of the year. You know why it's so important? Thankfulness is an expression of faith. Because when we're thankful, we're acknowledging our dependence upon God and we're acknowledging Him as the source of our blessings instead of ourselves. And if we're not thankful on a consistent basis, we're an idolater because basically what we're saying is, I've got it, I can handle it, I'm doing this, not you. Listen to what the Bible says in Romans chapter 1. Paul wrote this. He says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So the creation reveals the Creator. Verse 21, Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened, Professing to be wise, they became fools. And what they do, they change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. You see what he's saying there? Idolatry. I mean, even idolatry in the most obvious form where people are worshiping things that they make ultimately comes out of a failure to glorify God and to thank Him. It says, verse 24, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their bodies to dishonor their bodies among themselves. So even here we see that immorality, even sexual immorality, comes from idolatry that comes from a failure to glorify God. And verse 25 kind of wraps it up and he says, to exchange the truth of God for the lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. What's the lie? Well, it goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden that we can be our own God instead of needing God, instead of needing to give Him glory. So these sorry substitutes ignore the goodness of God. You see the goodness of God in your life. You see how blessed that you are. And, and, and do you see when you forget about God, ignore God, live for yourself, live for other things in the midst of those blessings that basically what God is saying to you is what's wrong with me? Let's move on. Number two. Sorry substitutes give glory to a false God instead of the real one. You see, we never exist in a vacuum. Like I said, everybody's a worshiper. It's only the, a question of what we're worshiping. Because look what he goes on to say here, verse 9. He says, Therefore, I will yet bring charges against you, says the Lord. And against your children's children I will bring charges. For pass beyond the coast of Cyprus and see, send to Kedar and consider diligently, and see if there's been such a thing. Verse 11 is the key here. Has a nation changed its gods, which are not gods? But my people have changed their glory for what does not profit. 
And so what he's saying here, even the idolaters are loyal to their gods and give them glory. But here I am, truly the glorious one, and now you have uh, substituted me for these fake gods, these idols. And so then the question then becomes, would we do that? There's a, once again, we're insatiably religious. There's something, someone that we're going to worship. Now, you say, well, you know, what can these idols look like in, in modern times? Let me show you some pictures. And if some of these kind of relate to the video. I mean, think about this for a minute. I mean, if, if somebody came down from Mars and, 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 and Entered in, wouldn't they not think that the, that the uh, stadium is a temple and that these people are, you know, worshiping their God, you know, all dressed up, and they're out in the parking lot at the tailgate offering sacrifices of food uh, to, to their God? Now, you say, well, you know, you, know, you like sports, yeah. I'm not saying anything wrong with sports. I'm just saying, you know, to what level do we take it? I guarantee you that some of the people in this picture are probably talking about those idiot Christians doing weird things in church on Sunday morning. You see what I'm saying? Uh, you kind of is, you know, if you're passionate about something, you do things that seem weird to other people. So, are we more passionate about our God or, or, or things like this? I mean, think about it. You know, something that drives me crazy with men. You say, I don't have time to read the Bible. You know, I can never memorize Scripture. But you can name the statistics and the hometown and 77 useless facts about the third string running back on some NFL team. Or if it's not football, you know, your favorite car racer or whatever it may be. And it's not about what we can learn and what we know and what we don't know. It's about what's most important to us and what we're passionate about and who we really love. So we need to stop making those stupid excuses. If Jesus isn't going to be first in our life, and you say you're a Christian, at least just be honest about it and stop playing the game. Well, let's pretend everybody. Come on. Right? Now, you say, well, you know, we've got to buy stuff. Right? Obviously. You can stop and turn into an idol. Spend money you don't have. If you find comfort in it. Right? If, if you're upset and you think, I gotta buy something. I gotta eat something, that'll make me feel better. You saying that's an idol? I mean, if, if this is the thing that, that you're just really, really passionate about it, and I, I you know, I gotta do I gotta, you know, this is just the thing. This is the most important thing to whatever the thing is. And you know, you're looking to the wrong government. Instead of looking at the Prince of Peace, who's got the government's upon his shoulder, who is our hope. Listen, if a politician's your hope, he's your idol. If you think if we get this party in and we enact this law, that everything's going to be okay, you have substituted politics for the gospel. I'm not saying we should vote. And there are things that are moral and immoral, right and wrong, and they're, you know... Uh, I hate judicial activism, and there are bad laws about abortion, and a lot of other things. And there's people that we ought to vote for, and there's, you know, there's. But if you think that getting certain people elected, or getting certain justices on the Supreme Court, or getting certain laws passed is going to make everything okay, your hope is in the wrong place, and you have the wrong guy. Let's move on. I don't even remember what's next. So, material things, car. Awesome house, uh, those, those kind of things. You say, is it wrong to have those? No. You know what? Somebody could um, have something like that, be content, rejoicing in the Lord, things are cool. Somebody else, you know, not have anything like that, they're coveting that. You know what we covet shows what our idols are. What we covet shows what our idols are. What's that? You know what that is? The Apple logo, right? And I'm not just picking on Apple. I mean, I've got an iPhone. I have a Mac computer in my office. I have an iPod. And I'm just using it because it's a well-known symbol. I mean, and there's all kinds of symbols. 
But when we like, when we have to have something, right? Whether it's a certain brand of clothing, a certain kind of anything, you think that thing is becoming an idol to us. Or if something runs our life, you know, if you spend hours and hours and hours a day on your computer or your phone, you know, on the internet, and, 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 and to the neglect of time with God, to the neglect of time with your family, those kind of things, that has become a false God in your life. And, you know, it can be, idols can be things, idols can be people. You know, I don't have a picture of this, but I mean, think about relationships. You ever seen, I've seen this a lot as a pastor. If somebody, maybe they're a new Christian or... Uh, maybe they just kind of come back to the Lord and they're single. And uh, almost something that I, that I just know to pray against is somewhere a few weeks, a few months down the road, that single person, some other person is going to come in their life. And I've seen in so many cases that say, say to the woman, that man becomes more of a God to them than Jesus. And they go away from Jesus and they walk with him. That's an idol. Um, how about this? Vodka. Alcohol, and uh, the, the reason that, that I point this out is, is look at the slogan of there. Absolute freedom. Now, I'm, looking, I'm not looking for any testimonies, but if, if any of you have ever you know had a problem with getting drunk in, 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 in your life, or, or drugs, or you know any you know addiction is a form of idolatry. I mean, you ever woke up with a hangover thinking, "I am absolutely free." today. You understand what idols do is they lie. They promise only what Jesus can deliver. Jesus brings freedom. Idols promise freedom and prosperity and goodness and hope and all these other things. But they lie because this is all said and done. They enslave us. How about religion? Maybe the biggest idol in the world. Is religion. And that's any religion that is not focused on Jesus Christ and the rest of God. Even religion that takes place in Christian churches. And there's a lot of it there. We're such an idolatrous nation that we even have our own brand of it. So is it wrong to watch that? I say, well, no, I watch the boys, so I watch Dancing with the Stars. Or something like that. I don't think that's the issue. Do we watch it with the gospel lens? Do we watch it to see some of those people, they're trying to use that as a platform to give glory to Jesus Christ. That's a good thing. You understand, anything we do, even if it's morally neutral in and of itself, which is singing, if God's giving you that gift, it's probably not morally neutral for me to sing in public, but, you know, if, if, if God's given you that gift, I mean, that's, that's an okay thing, but if you're not doing it for the glory of God, it becomes a sinful thing. We're idolaters. And these sorry substitutes, these idols, what they do is they give glory to a false god instead of the real one. And so what does that end up resulting in? We're we'll looking at verses 12 and 13. He says, Be astonished, O heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be very desolate, says the Lord. And, and this is really what it boils down to. He says, For my people have committed two evils. One, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. And then two, they have hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. Now, in Israel, Judah, you know, when this time this is written, basically, you had two ways to collect water. I mean, you know, they didn't have water fountains. You know, they didn't have water coolers like we have out here. You could find a fresh, natural flowing spring. That was your best option. Or when those weren't available, they used cisterns, which were kind of rock, underground, uh, water collection areas. Two problems with those, though. One, even if it worked right, the water would tend to get stagnant. But often it didn't work right. But, you know, there were cracks in it, that kind of thing. Holes developed, and so the water poured out. And what he's saying is, is that I'm like this fresh, flowing, cool, beautiful, clear spring that can truly refresh your soul and give you everything you need 
These idols are like these broken cisterns that can hold no water. So, here's what this is about. See, God is for Himself, number one, but He's also for us. And He wants the best for us. And He's a good God, and He wants to bless us, and He's for our joy. So what He's saying in these two verses, He's saying you've committed two evils. You've forsaken me, number one, you've not lived for my glory, but at the same time, you're hurting yourself because you're trying to be refreshed from a broken cistern that holds no water instead of letting me give you the water that will give you eternal life. That will truly fulfill, satisfy the thirst in your soul. Jesus said to the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, Whoever drinks of this water, water from the well, will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. You just feel dead, empty on the inside. You feel like something's missing. There's no peace. You're just tired of life. Go to the fountain of living water. Go to Jesus Christ and find life in Him. Stop basing your life on these dead, sorry substitutes that are broken cisterns that can never fulfill and never satisfy you. That's what He's saying. And so sorry substitutes, number three, leave us unsatisfied. And then number four, sorry substitutes bring pain into our lives. Sorry substitutes bring pain into our lives. Look at verses 14 through 19. He says, Is Israel a servant? Is he a homeborn slave? Why is he plundered? The young lions roared at him and growled. They made his land waste. His cities are burned without inhabitant. Also, the people of Noph and Tophanes have broken the crown of your head. Have you not brought this on yourself and that you have forsaken the Lord your God when he led you in the way? And now why take the road to Egypt to drink the waters of Sahor? And why take the road to Assyria to drink the waters of the river? Now, verse 19 is so huge. You, you just got to let this sink into your soul. This just hit me so hard this week. Your own wickedness will correct you. And your backslidings will rebuke you. And know, therefore, and see that it is an evil and bitter thing that you have forsaken the Lord your God, and the fear of me is not in you, says the Lord God of hosts. Your own wickedness will correct you, and your backslidings will rebuke you. If you've heard me preach much, you've probably heard me say something like, that I think the most miserable people in the world are people who are Christians and aren't walking through the world. Because you really can't be happy in your sin, and you're not happy with the Lord either, which just leaves you a miserable person. Why do I believe that? Well, that's what that verse is saying. We reap what we sow. We, we destroy ourselves with our idols. You understand? That's what Satan's plan for us is. He's happy for us to substitute anything, even a good thing, even religion. That's why that's such a big part of his plan. Even religion, because a good thing that becomes a God thing is an idol, and so it's a bad thing. It's a sorry substitute. And all it does is it brings pain and destruction. Oh, in the short term, it may bring pleasure. In the short term, it may bring comfort. In the short term, it may bring security. But it can't ultimately satisfy us. It's going to fall apart. So, what I want you to understand is when, when we don't put Jesus first, the consequences that come from that, in one sense, they're God's discipline. We're reaping what we sow. But here's, what, here's the thing I want you to see. You've got to get this. And I'm going to start. You've got to get this. They're also God's grace. You see, because when we're away from the Lord, and we're so empty and miserable and depressed and, and, and what God's doing is He's not letting us be satisfied with anything other than Him. And that's His goodness. And that's His grace. And a lot of you know what, what I'm talking about. You know where you were. You know where God brought you out of. And you know that that misery was necessary to bring you to the end of yourself so you could find the Lord and find His purpose and find what He truly has for you and experience the joy and the satisfaction that comes from that. Amen? But see, here's the thing I know after preaching for 25 years. And this, you know, being a pastor can be a wonderful thing. And it can be a painful thing. And here's one of the painful parts of it. 
I preach to people. I talk to people, counsel with people one on one. And sometimes what I know is this. They're not tired enough. They're not hurt enough. They're not empty enough. They really respond to it. You know, just float along and stick with your idols for a while. And God in His love will win them some more. And will win them some more. I guess my question for you is how low do you have to go? How empty do you have to be? What's God going to have to do to break you? What's God going to have to do in His love and grace to bring you to the end of yourself? See, because God loves you. And, and, and he, he, he does want to bless you. And He wants you to be with Him forever. Not ultimately for you, ultimately for Him and for His glory. But God... It's for our joy and for what's best for us. It's why Jesus said, I'm come, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. But he said, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. Satan wants to ruin your life. He wants to rob you. He wants you to base your life on sorry substitutes. Jesus wants to give you the real thing. You see, we see that only Jesus can save us. I mean, but just for time's sake, I'm going to read verses 27 and 28. It's saying to a tree, You're my father and to a stone. You gave birth to me. For they have turned their back to me and not their face. But in their time of trouble, they will say, Arise and save us. But where are your gods that you have made for yourselves? Let them arise. If they can save you in the time of your trouble, for according to the number of your cities are your gods, O oh, Judah. Listen, only Jesus can save you. Only He can make you whole. Only He can give you true joy. Only He can enable you to fulfill the purpose for which God created you, which is to give God glory. And if you are living for anything else, you are wasting your life. Don't waste your life. Repent and turn to the Lord. Trust Him. Stop running. for sorry substitutes. Thank Him. Give Him glory. Trust Him. Surrender to Him. Let Him have control. And, and let Him guide you in the way that He wants you to go. Let Him fill you up. When we glorify God, that's when we are truly satisfied. When we enjoy Him and live for Him and worship Him, that's when we find fulfillment in life because that's what He created us for. And life only works when we live it according to the way that God designed it. Don't waste your life on sorry substitutes. Live for the real, one, only, true God who revealed Himself through Jesus Christ, who died for us, who rose from you bow your heads and close your eyes. And we're going to have a song of invitation in a moment. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want to ask you a question. What's really your God? I mean, really. Not the church answer, but the real, true heart. I mean, what are you most passionate about? What do you give to? What, what are you sacrificing for? What's your life based on? Where are you looking for comfort and for peace? And if it's not Jesus, it's a sorry substitute that will leave you empty when it's all said and done. Listen, here's the invitation. It's very simple. You're not a Christian. Jesus is not your God. You can repent, receive Him into your life by faith right now. If you ask God to forgive you of your sins, if you truly believe in Jesus, if you confess Him as your Lord and your God, turn your life over to Him. He'll save you. He'll make you new. He'll fill you up with Himself. He'll give you a purpose in life. I just encourage you to do that right now. If you need some help in praying, I help you to pray, although it's got to be between you and God. It's got to come from the heart. But you pray something like this. Jesus, I have lived for my sin. I have not lived for your glory. I'm sinful. I'm guilty. I have no hope in me. I see that now. So, Lord, I need you. I ask you to come into my life. I ask you to forgive me my sins. I confess you as my Lord and my God and my Savior. 
I believe you died for me. I believe you rose from the dead. I ask you to take control of my life. I ask you to save me and make me alive. Because if you place your trust in him, he'll keep his word to give you and make you a new creation in Christ. Some of you are Christians, but you've got a divided heart. If you're, if you're honest, Jesus, you're not living like He's your Lord. He doesn't have first place in your life. There's things you're more into than Him. He invites you right now to repent of your backsliding in the words of what Jeremiah said. To come home to Him. To be restored to Him. To live for Him. To find His fulfillment. Don't make Him wound you more. Stop running. Come home to Him today. Just a second. We're going to stand. We're going to sing. I'm here at the front. If you need to talk, pray, come see me. If you just gave your life to Christ, or have questions about becoming a Christian, come and see me. Come to the altar and do business with the Lord. Just meet with Him. Don't worry about what anybody else thinks or what people are going to think. Just praise God. People pray for you. Just you and the Lord. Stop playing games. Stop holding back. Give yourself fully to Him today. Let's stand. Let's sing together. You respond. You move. Don't hold back.
I just ask that you would uh, just take this message and burn it into all of our hearts. Lord, I ask you to bring conviction to us. Lord, forgive me for when I put things before you, I do what I want to do, when I don't live for your glory. God, help all of us to just catch a glimpse of your glory today, to see your splendor and majesty, to see that that's what life is about. And Lord, I just ask you to convict us. And help us not to run away from you, but to run to you and to give you the glory that you do in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a good day. Come and talk to me. Pray to me too.